Okay, so welcome everyone for, to the Ross Francis Endowed Lecture. This lectureship was established in 1998 by the University of Washington and Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center to honor the invaluable work by Dr. Ross Francis as a joint faculty member in both institutions. Uh, the recipient to deliver the annual uh, Francis uh, lecture, this year's lecturer is Ken Rice, so congratulations, Ken. Uh, for his formal introduction, uh, introduction, I pass now the word to Charles Cooperberg, who is professor and program head of the Biostatistics Program of Health Science Division at the Fred Hutch. Dr. Cooperberg is also an affiliate professor in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Washington. So, so Charles. Thank you, Lourdes. Yeah, so just as a reminder, Ross is a professor of biostatistics at the University of Washington and a professor and former director of the Division of Public Health Sciences uh, at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He has made seminal contributions in areas such as survival analysis, case cohort studies, and surrogate endpoints. He was a longtime PI of the Women's Health Initiative. The 2020 Prentice Professor is Ken Rice. Ken Rice is a professor of, in the Department of Biostatistics at UW, having arrived here in 2004 from Cambridge where he was a first a graduate student and then a postdoc working with David Spiegelhalter. Ken's research focuses on developing and applying statistical methods for complex disease epidemiology, notably cardiovascular disease, as opposed to, to Ross, often from the Bayesian perspective. He's heavily involved in the NHLBI TopMed project, which is collecting and analyzing whole genome sequencing data and other omics data. He's in charge of the analysis committee of, for the CHARGE consortium, and he is an investigator at UW's Cardiovascular Health Research Unit. If his post CV is correct, he has been the dissertation chair for five PhD students and chairs seven master's theses. He has been a committee member for many others. The list was long and not numbered, so I decided not to count. He is known to be an excellent lecturer, and uh, be I should point out to you before I continue on this that this lecture is being recorded. If that, uh, and it, I also should point out to you that if you want to. Uh, ask questions that you should please use the chat box uh, during the lecture. I will pay attention to it, and after the lecture, uh, Ken himself will pay attention to it. So, uh, rather than uh, continuing, I should probably make space for uh, Ken's lecture. Since and since I'm not sure whether Ken is completely dressed up for uh, the uh, for this lecture, I will show you from how Ken sometimes dresses up. And uh, I can show, zoom this out a little bit here. Uh, it looks like he's a little bit less dressed today, but maybe he's also reading from a different script. Yes, so, also younger, Charles. So uh, Ken, uh, please uh, take it from here. Looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Charles. So uh, I'll just... Get my slides up. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's uh, a great privilege to be uh, giving the lecture this year. Um, just uh, a little bit of background. The first time I met Ross when he, was when he was uh, giving a, a similar lecture to a, a group I worked with in Cambridge. He was giving the Armitage lecture. So it's uh, very nice to be uh, up uh, in, in a more senior position than, than giving the Prentice lecture this year. Uh, Charles, do you want to give me a thumbs up if you can see, see, see the slides? That's all working? Great. Thank you very much. So. Uh, this talk is called uh, Striving for Balance, and I'm going to talk about how to view uh, statistical methods as trade-offs, and I want to stress that it's uh, some joint work uh, between uh, myself and uh, Chloe and Kendrick, who are both grad stu graduate students in the department. If you'd like to read ahead, uh, or if you just want to click through to, to some of the links and things that are mentioned in the slides, then you can go to the website there, which is also interest, interested, uh, so also given in, in the chat, uh, and you can find the link there and, and, and download those and uh, with them as you will. So uh, a little bit about uh, Ross and, and a quotation to, to start with him from, uh, which is motivation for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, here he is in, in the past, present and future of statistical science, uh, saying that statistical training is highly valuable for participation and leadership roles in shaping and carrying out the needed research. As mentioned, this in, in this mighty tome of a book uh, all about the past, present and future, and he's in chapter 32, which is so many chapters, I guess that's heading towards the future at least. Uh, in, in statistics and, and public health was the topic that he wrote about. Uh, and uh, we've been doing this uh, um, valuable participation in, in leadership in the needed research for, for some time, and I guess we're gonna keep doing it as well. And that's why I tell students who are very much less expert in statistics than, than Ross is. Uh, in Biostatistics 1 in 514 or 517, um, the, the first uh, introductory course for uh, masters and PhD students in, in Biostat and some other topics too, 
then they hear very much the same thing that, that Ross is saying there, that it's our role to, to justify choices of analysis design uh, and, and shape and carry out the needed research and, and not just to do the number crunching. And that's news to, to, to many of them, frankly, uh, that um, they view the person, the statistician is the person who produces the, the P's and the T's uh, and, uh, and that's it. But of course our, our role is, is much bigger as Ross has illustrated uh, so well over the years. Um, however, uh, for the students coming in, then it's, uh, it's, it's a big challenge uh, to, to move from just crunching numbers to thinking about uh, why we're doing particular analyses, what they give us, uh, what their strengths and weaknesses are as well. And uh, they, they find it a hard course, often much harder than they expect. Uh, and uh, they've got many criteria to, to balance, just a, a quick list we can think of bias and precision and robustness, uh, the fact that we can compute any of these things quickly, uh, are we looking at causal inference or not, uh, and are we being scientifically relevant or not? So there's you know, um, many different criteria that, that we have to balance there, and, and learning to balance them is uh, something that students and, and statisticians in general uh, have to get to grips with and often need some help with doing. Uh, learning to, to balance is also something that my three-year-old daughter is, is interested in, uh, and this is what she's getting for Christmas, but don't tell her yet. Um, and uh, it's a, a useful skill that yeah, many, many people, uh, not just three-year-olds and grad students, need, need a bit of a help with. So I'm going to describe uh, what's a general language uh, or balancing statistical criteria. A uh, little asterisk there, as, as Charles pointed out, then, then the Bayesian uh, method of doing things is probably not Ross's preferences, not, not Ross's preference, but um, that's, uh, it, it turns out to be a, a nice way to, to balance statistical criteria. Uh, I stress it's a fairly general language, and so I'm not going to show you everything it can do today, uh, but I will uh, go through a couple of examples in, in some detail. Uh, first of all, uh, looking at regression to the mean biases, uh, where we require uh, very small p-values, less than some critical threshold, and this is motivated from, from GWAS that uh, I think lots of people in the department have worked on, uh, where we know there are these biases creep in when we just look at the winners, and there's the winner's curse. And I'll also talk uh, a little bit more generally about uh, how we can um, trade off or how we can balance uh, essentially a model-based efficiency uh, of learning about particular parameters versus weakness to or reliance on, on those uh, assumptions that go into to param parametric models. So how can we trade off uh, those two things and come out with a, with a good answer? Uh, and we'll see that as our second example. So um, onto the guts of it then. Uh, as I say, it's a general language and not one I'm claiming to have invented, uh, but uh, rather uh, Arnold Zellner did uh, back in 1994 uh, and called it balanced loss functions. So a little bit about Zellner, if you haven't seen him before, uh, this is a bookmark on the left here uh, that the Stata Corporation will sell you uh, if you want one, uh, if you're short of Christmas present ideas, uh, my three-year-old's not getting one of these, uh, then uh, they will sell you a bookmark telling you about Arnold Zellner uh, who died 10 years ago and how great he was. Uh, one of the, and, he, and he was, he developed a whole bunch of things, including uh, the International Society for Bayesian Analysis. Uh, but uh, one of his academic contributions was uh, a balanced loss function, where uh, he considered a, a loss function which is like this one at the top. Uh, and what it's doing is uh, making a, a trade-off between, well, a criteria, a couple of criteria that we, we probably know reasonably well. Uh, first of all, this is in, in linear regression, so we've got beta coefficients and design matrices X and outcome vector Ys in the usual sort of notation. Uh, this is essentially, uh, on the left here, this inaccuracy term is essentially squared errors uh, for the beta hats uh, around the truth beta. So we want to be close to the truth, uh, we want to be accurate, uh, we don't want to be inaccurate. Uh, but we also want to uh, have a good fit to the data, to, to the outcomes y, uh, and uh, this uh, sort of L2 uh, measure of, of, of badness of fit, how far away are your fitted values from, from the observations, uh, is a competing criteria. And so uh, we could uh, consider how well we do in, in one uh, criteria or in the other, but actually we, uh, what Zellner proposed was a very simple uh, weighted average, if you like, a uh, weighted combination of, of the two of them. At a particular trade-off rate that he called W, a weight, if you like, uh, W over here, and one minus W, uh, expressing which of these criteria we're gonna pay most attention to, which gets the higher value of W or, or one minus W. And uh, Zellner showed that uh, to get good estimates based on this criteria, then you basically go from uh, OLS, uh, which would, uh, uh, optimize the, the, the goodness of fit uh, towards uh, a Stein style shrunken estimate uh, that's um, a, 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 a bit more accurate. He didn't ex expressly give an estimator was that just the uniformly best thing to do here, uh, but he showed that the shrinkage estimators uh, of something like a Stein style of estimate seem, seem to do uh, better than, than just OLS when we consider these uh, more general uh, loss functions than just uh, the, uh, the accuracy of the fit on its own. But of course, uh, these aren't the only uh, 
criteria that, that we could trade off. Um, and indeed, there are slightly strange things to, to trade off. Um, this one, about as if it depends on how noisy the data are, how if there's some uh, in a linear model, if there's some sigma term dis describing how noisy uh, the observations y are, uh, it features on the left over here, but it doesn't really feature on uh, features on the right over here, but it doesn't really feature on the left over on this side. Uh, and so uh, the criteria or your interpretation of that weight, uh, trade-off rates w to one minus w, that might be different depending on how noisy the data was, and, and the loss function doesn't say that. So it's a it does some good things, but it's certainly not the end of the story uh, to, to use uh, Zellner's balanced loss function as he presented it. There are other things that we could trade off. Uh, we could have measures of, of accuracy uh, versus uh, models of fit, and uh, we could have things that scale perhaps a little bit more sensibly and don't depend on the noise. Uh, we might be as interested in, in particular aspects of, of the model fit, not just are the linear predictors uh, predicting the outcomes well, but uh, are they uh, close in, in some other sense? Um, do we want to upweight or downweight particular types of observations when well, we might consider that. We could also trade off accuracy versus simplicity. Uh, if we want estimates to be close to zero or perhaps exactly equal to zero, uh, do we get an extra reward for doing that? That's not present in Zellner's uh, formulation of the balanced loss function, but you could build it in with other uh, trade-offs. Uh, and uh, we can also make trade-offs that uh, are at rates which are themselves decisions. So Zellner fixed a, a W, uh, and that determined a lot of what the answer was going to be, what, uh, what would be a, a good decision or otherwise. Uh, but we could have the data decide that for us as well and, and use a, a data adaptive uh, method of, of trade-off. So, um, that's where we're going to go. We're going to use that sort of uh, approach of, of trading off uh, two criteria or, or more uh, to get good decisions that, that balance those criteria, perhaps in data adaptive ways. Uh, throughout, then we're going to be looking at trade offs that must be dimensionally uh, sensible. Uh, and there's a thing known in, in decision theory as the, as the Robert paradox, paradox named after um, French statistician Christian Robert, uh, where he noticed that he and some co authors uh, noticed that if you have uh, a trade off that makes uh, a trade-off of uh, volume for a set decision, think about a confidence interval radius if you like, uh, and trade-off that against a, a zero or one indicator for whether or not that covered, that uh, confidence interval covers the truth or not, then uh, trying to formulate confidence intervals that way doesn't work very well, uh, it, it turns out. Uh, that Things don't scale well uh, because uh, your volume is measured in you know, units of theta, whatever theta is, and coverage isn't measured in any units uh, at all. So, um, that's a, a problem, and we should think about uh, trade-offs in, in uh, trade-offs of quantities that make sense, at least in terms of a dimensional sense. So, um, there, there's one question here, Ken. Yep. Go ahead. Somebody wants to know whether for the loss function L, wh whether we optimize over beta hat and assume that beta is known, or do we also optimize over beta in one way or another? Uh, well, I'm going to be op optimizing over the decision with uh, respect to the posterior uncertainty about uh, the parameters. So that's the way I'm going to implement it. Uh, Zell Zellner was uh, uh, fairly ambiguous about which way brain you should do things. Um, but uh, yeah, click through to click through the paper if you want to see how he did it. Okay. Um, so an example of, of one of those loss functions and, and how we use it, uh, and this I hope is uh, at least somewhat familiar to anyone who's taken a course that, that featured Bayesian analysis. Uh, this is just for, for estimation, uh, a loss with no balancing term yet, though so we'll put one in shortly. Uh, we just have quadratic loss. So that's a loss function that says that uh, your estimates D, uh, if it's far away from theta, then that's bad. Uh, and how bad it is increases with the square of the distance between your decision D uh, and, and the truth uh, theta. So here, are, uh, here is a, first of all, we've got a green posterior distribution here. It's a revolting green color. Uh, that's a beautifully normal looking distribution. And uh, I've, got, I've given you some potential uh, values of the decision and the loss that goes with them. So uh, you could have a loss that's over here uh, and the quadratic loss uh, around it uh, would uh, look like that, so, or a loss that's got a, a lighter line over here, a quadratic loss uh, around it. And you see that the, um, depending on the value of theta, which is the x-axis, so then uh, the, the loss increases quadratically uh, around those particular points. So which of these curves is the best one to choose? Uh, which has got the best uh, loss when you average the loss 
uh, over the, the resulting green distribution, then uh, of course it turns out that it's the posterior mean, which you can sort of at least uh, semi-believe just by eyeballing this problem. Uh, and that's the, the, the red line with the yellow glow around it. Uh, that's the right answer. Uh, and it's centered, of course, the center of the, of the green distribution. So that's the best decision uh, to use for this particular Bayesian posterior. And one of the nice things about decision theory is it tells you what to do. Uh, all you have to do is specify the loss function, then everything else is just a matter of uh, turning the handle or doing the computations or you know, however you want to, to think of it, but it, it, it tells you what analysis to do. So this one would tell us to use the posterior mean uh, as, as the estimate, uh, which of course is a perfectly sensible uh, estimate in, in most applications. Okay, now let's uh, look at one of these balanced loss functions. And uh, there's a small picture, but it's doing much the same sort of thing. I'm now gonna make two decisions. <clears throat> One's called D, um, and it's the same sort of estimate thing that we saw before. One's called V, and that's a measure of, well, uh, spread, it turns out. Uh, and here's our loss function. So we've got 30 minus D squared sitting on top there uh, in the same way as before. And we're also going to make a trade-off with respect to, to V. So log V uh, is a in slowly increasing function, and 1 over V uh, is a decreasing function. So make a trade-off between those two quantities uh, where the rate of uh, trade-off is given by 30 minus D squared. Uh, so what does that look like uh, in, what do these uh, losses look like uh, in terms of uh, functions of theta? Well, uh, they're here. Uh, and so for uh, D being this uh, value over here on the left, I could either give you a, uh, a small value of uh, V, uh, which gives you a, a loss function that dips down lower because of the log uh, V term there, uh, and then goes up more steeply because a small value of V uh, makes the quadratic term uh, get, get bigger more quickly. Or you could have a lower value of V uh, or an intermediate one and the, uh, the lowest value of V, um, sorry, the highest value of V uh, gives us the, the highest uh, value in, in the middle there uh, and the lowest rates of increase as, as we go to the side. Same thing over here for uh, decision centered at the posterior mean, uh, again, with different values of decision V, uh, giving the different steepnesses uh, of these quadratic curves, and, and you could center it over here as well. Uh, it's a little more, bit more difficult to, to eyeball this particular problem, but uh, I hope it's uh, somewhat intuitive that the decision D uh, that you make about the estimate should still, just by symmetry, be in the center of the green posterior. Uh, and then it turns out that uh, to optimize uh, that choice uh, of decision V, then uh, the thing to do is to report the posterior variance. And so that adequately balances uh, the uh, advantage that we get uh, by having a value of log V that's uh, a little bit lower down um, at, at the bottom of those parabola versus um, the steepness that we see in increasing, uh, the, which comes from the one over V term there. So uh, that's a, a balanced loss function. It's balancing this term over here with this one over here. They're both in, in expressions in V, uh, but we can optimize them fairly straightforwardly and uh, one tells us about the decision that we're making um, for an estimate. And one tells us about um, how much accuracy there is there in the posterior in order to, to make that estimate. Uh, this loss function uh, is a thing called loss estimation. Uh, and you can think of that the V decision as estimating how bad uh, the decision D was with respect uh, to parameter theta there. So uh, you get fairly sensible things uh, out of these loss functions. And we're gonna see what else we can, we can get out of them uh, by constructing uh, slightly different loss functions, which as they um, makes trade-offs between quantities that we may be, may be interested in. So this uh, is a, a version of uh, pretty much the same thing. Uh, I won't show you green and red pictures now, but uh, it's doing much the same thing. I I'm gonna give us sh uh, shrinkage estimates. Our loss then uh, is still just gonna be uh, for decisions uh, D and V, and depends on what uh, the true value of theta is. And we've got the same uh, basic trade-off of a term in log of V and then one over V uh, multiplying something else, which has got um, terms in, in theta and, and D minus uh, flying around in it. Uh, but it's, uh, well, it's an average of two quantities, a weighted average of the inaccuracy uh, measurement that we saw before. And a thing I'm calling embarrassment, which is a sum of squared distances, uh, distance from our decision D to some null value. You think of that as zero, if you like. And uh, what I'm calling embarrass, uh, well, uh, and then uh, a measure of how far theta is uh, from, uh, again, from, from zero. So there's strength of the true signal uh, versus uh, how close your decision is, is to, to, uh, to zero itself. So if you reported, uh, when does this thing get big? Well, uh, if your decision is very close to zero, then this quantity is, is not going to contribute very much. So we needn't worry about it. Uh, but if your decision is, is close to zero, but the truth is far from zero, then that's really embarrassing. 
Um, and so you get a big contribution there. Uh, it's embarrassing because you, for example, you've missed the new penicillin. Uh, you've completely uh, misinterpreted uh, an effect which is really strong in either a positive or a negative effect, and that, that's not good. And it would be embarrassing to do that. Uh, and that's a slightly different quantity uh, to just plain old inaccuracy where you make an estimate and, the, and it's either accurate or, or not accurate. Uh, this has uh, got more to do with whether the truth is as close to zero and uh, what we might think about a good and bad decisions based on on that um, uh, on that uh, distance from from zero. So uh, reporting d uh, equal the null value equal to thirty zero is bad uh, is uh, embarrassing or reporting decisions as close to that is embarrassing if uh, that is far from uh, theta is zero. Uh, what we get out of this uh, loss function is um, as you probably guessed then uh, it's uh, it's an average. Uh, it turns out that uh, we can do all, all the optimization stuff that we just saw for the simpler loss functions, but we get uh, a shrunken version of the posterior mean, i.e. the posterior we get just using simple quadratic loss d minus theta squared on its own. And how much uh, that gets shrunken to some value that's usually going to be zero, but I'll call theta zero, uh, is determined by that trade-off rate s to one minus s. So uh, much like uh, Zellner's setup we had is, is weight W that you fixed in advance, then sure, you could do the same thing here uh, and you would get a fixed amount of shrinkage. Uh, instead of reporting the posterior mean, you would report 80% of the posterior mean or 50% of the posterior mean, depending on your choice uh, of S. Now, if I let you choose uh, the shrinkage, the degree of shrinkage uh, based on this loss function, if I made S a decision and, and optimized with respect to it, it turns out uh, that you'd always pick uh, you'd put all the weight uh, on this inaccuracy term. And that's uh, basically because uh, variances are smaller than the mean squared errors. Uh, it turns out this quantity is always gonna be uh, smaller in expectation and posterior compared to this quantity. Uh, and so you'd always plump for that one. You'd put S equal to one, you go as, put as much weight as possible uh, on that term and ignore all the rest. So that's not, not very interesting, uh, but uh, we can fix that problem if we penalize. Uh, decisions that use smaller trade-offs. Uh, if we penalize S being uh, close, close to one is, is another way of saying that. So this is exactly the same loss function that, that I just showed you, uh, but now with a weighting term uh, stuck on, on the front there. And uh, I've, uh, it, it's convenient, it turns out, to, to write it as f of S over one minus S, uh, because uh, for some uh, weighting function s that's uh, that's saying how much uh, attention we pay to uh, trade-offs that are made at different rate trade-off rates s. Um, it turns out that the, the Bayes rule for this is not much more complicated uh, than, than we, we got before. Uh, the Bayes rule does exactly the same sort of weighted average thing that I was showing you on the previous slide there. But now how is S chosen? Well, it depends on F, of course. It depends on that weighting function. And it turns out uh, this is what you need to minimize in order to find the Bayes rule, the, the best decision uh, for that, that scaling or, or shrinking uh, decision S. Uh, so you have to minimize that quantity, um, and you'll notice that that only depends on the posterior, only depends on the data through a rather simple quantity over here. Uh, this thing that looks a lot like a Walt statistic, uh, it's the expected deviation of theta from the null value divided by the variance of theta, which is um, almost exactly the same. It's the Bayesian analog of a Walt statistic uh, for um, any form of statistical testing that, that you're familiar with. Theta minus, uh, theta, is, theta hat minus theta zero squared divided by the uh, the estimated variance of, of theta hat. So um, the amount of shrinkage that we get is only determined by whatever you choose for f and what I'm calling the, the signal to noise ratio, uh, the square root of that Walt statistic thing, uh, that uh, there it is and uh, you get very much the same answer uh, for z uh, if, or z tilde as I'm calling it in a Bayesian analysis as you would with uh, z in a, uh, a classic wall test. So um, we do need to, to make uh, some choices about what uh, weighting decision F we're gonna use, uh, but uh, this, is, this is where uh, Ross's Bayesian hat uh, comes in. So uh, let's uh, use an example that Ross studied uh, in some detail to, to motivate a particular choice of, of weighting function and, and see where it takes us. So um, we're gonna uh, look at weighting functions that have got some uh, nice properties with regards to regression to the mean. Uh, and for an audience of statisticians, I, I think I probably don't need to tell you uh, too much about regression to the mean. Um, uh, as, as you're very well aware, I think, then very tall parents uh, tend to have not quite so tall uh, children, which is an observation that was due to Galton in 
1886, no less. Uh, there's his, his graph of uh, the straight line that you'd expect if y was equal to x and the regression slope that you get instead, which is a bit lower uh, because of all the uh, environmental luck, let's say, all the little random things that uh, contributed to the parents' height. They don't all go the same way uh, in, in the children's height and the children end up being not quite so tall or the children are very short parents end up being not quite so short. Um, he developed it uh, with a complicated pulley mechanism thing over here, uh, but it's, uh, it's really not uh, that complicated. You can uh, capture it on, in terms of Sports Illustrated uh, by saying that um, sportsmen who are lucky in, in one year um, tend not to be as lucky in the next. Uh, and so there's a jinx if you're on sports, uh, if you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated one year that you'll have a terrible year uh, next year. Uh, it also happens in, in movie making. Uh, that uh, all the magical, wonderful movie making things that went right uh, in the Matrix, all in the construction of the movie, The Matrix, uh, they didn't go quite so well in uh, The Matrix Reloaded, which is which is rubbish, uh, particularly compared to, to the original movie there. Um, it happens in sports, uh, not just on the cover, but I'm interested that the Mariners seem to be uh, using it as a strategy that they rely on uh, in order to do better uh, after having completely awful games, which is most of their season, most years, as far as I can tell. Anyway, so regression to the mean. Um, how does it affect things in, in GWAS? Uh, here are some schematic pictures that I've uh, convinced epidemiologists that, this, that, you know, uh, that there's something to worry about here with. So uh, this is uh, my, my picture here is of, um, think of it as standard epi epidemiology, standard well done epidemiology, let's say. We're um, estimating, uh, we've got a, where beta hat might come out and where the estimated standard error might come out. Uh, and uh, there's a cloud of data points that are the plausible outcomes of a study that you're doing. Uh, if you've got a, a large effect, then a large positive effect, then we're sitting above the axis here and we're sitting, we've got a fairly large standard error, uh, but these contours, this red triangle thing indicates uh, where you'd lie uh, to get a significant test result uh, from the data, beta hat divided by its estimated standard error uh, being equivalent to a p-value of uh, 0.05. So most of the time you've got you get a significant result, i.e. Uh, you've got good power. And uh, there's you know, a little bit of a problem uh, to, to worry about uh, if you only report things that are, are very significant at 0.05, but uh, not, not too much. Uh, compare that to, to GWAS, uh, where we have, um, well, a few different things going on. First of all, uh, much smaller effect sizes. Uh, yes, it's positive effect, but it's much closer to zero other than the previous picture. Uh, a much smaller standard error, and that's uh, compared to that one, and that's because we've got um, many more observations. We use huge sample sizes for GWAS and, and related work, uh, particularly these days. Uh, but we've also got a different significance threshold. Uh, and instead of being 0.05, which is the red line, uh, we've got a line out at what I like to call 10 to the minus exciting, uh, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9 uh, p-values of, of that sort of thing are, are what we need to, to limbo under the bar of multiple comparisons uh, in GWAS. And so, um, sure, we need to have a much uh, bigger signal to noise ratio. So, um, that's where we're at in, in, in GWAS. And uh, let's zoom in uh, on that little uh, area that, that's um, where the data are likely to lie. And what happens? Uh, well, we report our GWAS findings and we go and get excited and publish them in Nature Genetics and, well, occasionally uh, Nature and things uh, still these days and uh, get very excited about the ones that are outside the purple line, that are above uh, the purple line there. So these are the only ones that we see. Despite the truth being down here, uh, the, there's the true beta uh, and it's uh, true standard error. Uh, we estimate both of those things. And of course, we don't estimate them perfectly precisely. The ones that we see uh, are the ones where uh, we see uh, overestimates of, of beta hat. Uh, it turns out slight um, underestimates of the standard error as well, but it's a more noticeable effect on, on the beta hats. And uh, if you take all those um, vertical axis coordinates, and see what sort of distribution they get. Uh, it's something very much like this. So uh, the estimates are biased away from the null compared to the truth, and they may not even get particularly close to the truth in, in, in many situations. Uh, that uh, really quite big uh, biases away from the null are, are very standard. Um, how to explain this to, to epidemiologists? Well, you're seeing GWAS hits because you were lucky. Uh, even with your sample size of, uh, I've done studies with sample sizes of, of well over a million now. Uh, and uh, but there's such small effect sizes uh, and such stringent uh, multiple testing criteria that we need to be lucky in order to find things. And we are lucky sometimes, and, and you know, the science works, uh, but it does rely on, on us being lucky, uh, at least to a considerable extent. Um, whatever estimate you got um, from your, your significant result is generally not a very good one, as this graph, I hope, is, is scaring you into seeing. Um, and uh, how to interpret that? Well, um, 
one way of, of explaining this problem about uh, conditioning on getting a significant p-value is uh, you can talk about conditioning on, on a rare event, which is a sort of formal mathematical way to do it. But a less formal way of saying this is that after your p-value has, has walked all the way out to, to 10 to the minus exciting and your data is too tired, it's, it's had a hard day and it needs a rest and it needs something else to do that, that's not GWAS uh, and it's, it's too tired to give you a decent estimate. Exactly uh, how bad an overestimate is is not at all clear from this picture because it hasn't got a scale on it and is in general quite hard to uh, to determine because it depends um, on on power uh, and we don't know power and, and we never know power exactly so uh, it's fairly challenging I think to uh, intuitively uh, come up with a correction for this which is going to get you uh, less biased uh, estimates from the significant results so, so it's conditional mean bias that we're talking about here uh, but uh, what happens when you just look at the significant results uh, what sort of correction could you do there in order to make the results uh, less biased in order to uh, avoid that problem of, of just looking at things because you were lucky um, I should add uh, and this is something I just found out a couple of days ago uh, it's not just in, in GWAS this is a lovely uh, histogram of uh, 1.3 million uh, Z statistics uh, Z values, uh, which uh, basically scraped all of PubMed uh, for all the p-values and, and uh, estimates and confidence intervals and things and turned them into Z statistics. And you see, um, sure, normal-ish tails on the left and on the right, uh, and this massive hole in the middle uh, where people aren't publishing things because they don't have uh, p less than, than 0.05. So it's not just GWAS uh, where, where this happens, uh, uh, of course. Anyway. Uh, how do we do uh, this correction? Well, uh, as with many problems in statistical uh, inference and, and other methods, then uh, it's a good idea to ask Ross uh, and see what he did. Uh, and this is what he did in 2008 with, uh, with Judy Zhang, uh, who are uh, the guys in the pictures here, of course. And uh, this is the correction. I've uh, presented it here in terms of the, the log 10 of the p-value, because that's what we use a lot uh, in GWAS. So 10 to the minus 8 uh, comes in at... Um, uh, this position on the uh, x-axis, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10. Uh, these are some uh, alpha levels that are floated around for significance in genome-wide association studies and, and similar work uh, sequencing data now. Um, and so let's have 10 to the minus 8, because 5 times 10 to the minus 8, because it's the most commonly used one. Uh, if you get 5 times 10 to the minus 8, uh, then according to this correction, you should be dividing things by about a factor of 10. Um, so bring your estimate down by uh, an order of 10. Uh, an order of magnitude and that has of course has a huge impact on uh, planning uh, replication work that uh, the sample size that you need in order to, to replicate whatever it was that happened at uh, five times 10 to the minus eight uh, is colossally bigger than it would be if you'd used the naive estimate uh, and not shrunken at all so um even though it's not perfect and and, and you know, Ross and Judy didn't claim it was perfect. Uh, this has been a, a hugely helpful result to me in practice to be able to show this to people who are publishing GWAS results and say, okay, let's follow them up, but let's be uh, let's plan a much bigger replication study than, than you'd previously thought about. Uh, even if we uh, used a, a far more liberal threshold, then if we're just limboing in the, under the bar of significance, if we're getting uh, p-values of you know four times 10 to the minus seven when our significance threshold was at five times 10 to the minus seven, then we need to be really uh, cautious about uh, planning a replication work and, and in general thinking about uh, what that result means. Uh, we have to be uh, really uh, cautious uh, about it and think a lot uh, about this regression to the mean bias uh, because it's um, it's a you know, it's a big issue. So um, that's uh, Ross, and, Ross and Judy's uh, method. How can we measure that? How can we uh, develop it a little bit more? Is uh, where I want to what I want to show you. So uh, I'm going to do this for uh, alpha 0.05 because I think that's more familiar uh, to people. But uh, here is uh, the same sort of graph that I show you on a slightly different scale. Uh, this is uh, in terms of, of a Z statistic. So uh, if you get a, a Z statistic of, uh, well, 1.96, of course, is the usual uh, threshold for a significance of 0 0.05, then uh, Ross and Judy say to uh, shrink uh, by about a factor of four. It comes down to about uh, 0.26. There. And if uh, so if you were just again limboing under the bar of significance, if you had a much more significant result, uh, a Z statistic of four or five, five point five is, is for GWAS, uh, uh, GWAS levels of significance, uh, then sure, uh, with alpha equals 0.5, then there's really nothing to worry about, and the estimate is, is going to do fine. They get uh, this mean shrinkage bias by uh, solving uh, this set of equations here, and what it's I won't go through the details of it, but what it's really doing, it's a uh, Think about it as a conditional method of moments thing you look in the, the normal tail uh, in the correct and incorrect directions uh, and I look at the density restricted to those which is uh, where this thing comes from 
So there is a formula you, you have to solve it, uh, and that's what uh, gives the curve there. Uh, the middle gray area in the middle here is grayed out because it doesn't really matter uh, what we do in, in the middle there. Uh, we uh, we wouldn't be looking at those anyway uh, in given our conditioning uh, that we're only conditioning on the different results and, and these results in the middle uh, wouldn't be significant. How does it do? What's the conditional mean? What's the expected value of our estimates theta hat for those results which are significant? Uh, well, it depends on the, the value of the, the, the true signal that you're estimating. Uh, this is in standard error units. But if you have a really clear signal, then sure, uh, you get pretty much unbiased. Estimates, unbiased estimates would lie along the dashed line. Uh, Ross and Judy's ones go are slightly underestimates there. There's slight overestimates there uh, where you've got a much weaker signal. But compare that to, to the gray line, which is what you get uh, from, from doing nothing. Uh, and that you're substantially uh, reducing the bias there. So it's, it's much better, even at 0.05. It's, it's not quite as dramatic as it is uh, for, for GWAS uh, settings, but it's a, uh, a noticeable and, and welcome uh, difference that you can, you can do better with it there. So um, that's what Ross and Judy did. How do you view as Bayesian? Well, I really got into this by looking at it uh, from, from that graph I was just showing you with the, the Ross and Judy curve there in, in, in purple, dipping down and, and coming back up again. And that's not too far. Uh, it turns out from uh, a, a version of Stein's estimate uh, for shrinkage, the one that uh, dominates the, the sample mean in, in multivariate normal uh, situations, but you can do it for uh, one-dimensional situations as well. Uh, all it means is having a shrinkage estimate that um, depends on uh, basically uh, one minus constant divided by the z-squared statistic that, that you got. And remember, um, all our, our Bayesian uh, shrinkage estimates from that family uh, that we determined from, from the loss function, they just depend on a z-statistic. So we're in, the, we're in the right ballpark here. Um, Stein's version, uh, Stein's estimates uh, that you might want to apply in this case uh, would shrink all the way down to zero. But again, it doesn't really matter what's happening in, in the middle there. Uh, this version of it that I can calculated here uh, does, does fairly well, frankly. It's not as good as, as, as Ross and Judy's method. Um, because uh, it's giving us uh, even more, well, slightly more uh, noticeable underestimates for very extreme signals. Uh, you see that curve isn't coming up as fast as, as the purple one, so that's what's leading to, to modest problems there. But if you went out far enough, uh, then that would uh, disappear and, and you'd get back to essentially unbiased estimates. Turns out these things are remarkably similar in, in the Bayesian uh, version. And here are those weighting functions. I'll, I'll go back to... Um, uh, the loss function back there. Uh, here is, I'm going to show you a weighting function that justifies uh, both of them, both the, the Stein estimate and uh, Ross and, uh, and Judy's one. So um, what does that weight function look like? Well, it um, is a heavy penalty uh, to uh, shrinkage that uh, just gives the, the regular estimates uh, and encourages uh, shrinkage uh, towards, uh, to, towards zero. Um, Based on what I was saying before about the, the variance being smaller than the mean squared error, that's pulling the, the, uh, the decision about S towards the right-hand side here. But of course, that's where it's costly. So there's a, there's a trade-off and uh, you run in, in some sweet spot that's the, uh, the best choice uh, somewhere between uh, zero and, and one. Uh, the, the weights are, are really extremely similar uh, between uh, Stein's estimate and, and Zong Francis's, uh, and that's why the, the results uh, come out uh, so similar as well. Uh, and they're both uh, using just the uh, the z statistic uh, and uh, the way that it's being used in the in the Bayes version is to substitute z tilde, that um, Bayesian wall test statistic type thing, uh, for for the regular uh, z, the regular wall test z, there as well. Uh, and so that's the uh, that's our motivation, our Bayesian motivation of what Ross and Judy and also Stein uh, were, were doing. So. Um, on thinking about those estimates, then, okay, we're getting much the same sort of answers with, with Stein as, as with uh, Ross and Judy's method. Um, you know, there are a lot of curves that could look similar to these, these purple and green ones. And remember, it doesn't really matter uh, what we do in the middle. So um, here's uh, another choice. It's rather simpler. Uh, it's a different color. It's red this time. Uh, and it's just a straightforward step function. And the way that I've set things up here is to try and get as close as possible to, to Ross and Judy's uh, performance uh, over here uh, in terms of how well the conditional bias uh, works out, uh, but with a, with a simpler uh, form of shrinkage. And this is a really form of simple form of shrinkage. It's saying that uh, for p-values less than 0 0.005, don't do anything. Just trust the results. That's all fine. Uh, report the original beta hat uh, and don't worry about uh, bias. And then for uh, anything that's uh, just significant, so between 0 0.05 and 0 0.005, uh, either on the negative side or the positive side of a positive and negative estimates, then shrink things by a quarter. 
um, well, actually 0.26, but yeah, near enough a quarter. Uh, and that turns out it, it does um, almost uh, equally, uh, well, you could actually, depending on whether you, you care about uh, small or large effects, uh, you could say it arguably does slightly better uh, than, than Ross and Judy's method. Uh, the value of, of 0 0.005 is not entirely random here. I've plucked this um, from uh, Val Johnson's uh, somewhat controversial paper where that's been suggested recently as a the, the significance threshold that we should be using uh, in order to reduce a lot of false positives and non-reproducible results and all sorts of uh, things that lead to controversies about uh, testing and, and p-values and things. Um, is that's the that point 005, 5 times 10 times to the minus three has been suggested as a uh, new default uh, criteria for significance tests. So um, that's um, something we could use um, and perhaps we could tell people that we shouldn't actually be zero leave results uh, until you beat 0 0.005. If you get, an, another way of saying that is uh, if you get 0 0.005, p-value of 0 0.005 or below, then sure, believe the test result and believe the estimate. Uh, if you're only in that um, statistical no man's land between 0 0.005 and 0 0.05, then uh, maybe just just the test result, but don't believe the estimate at all, which is you know not the worst advice. However, uh, we can, um, this looks like uh, Ross and Judy's uh, performance pretty much, but, just in terms of bias, it turns out you can do rather better uh, with this remarkable looking shrinkage estimate that was uh, fun to work out. So for this one, uh, then we're going to go up to P, uh, that uh, statistical no man's land will go from P equals 0.04 to 0.05. If you're unlucky enough to get a p-value in that range, take your estimate, multiply it by four and a half, sorry, by minus uh, four and a half. The shrinkage comes way down, way below zero here. Otherwise, do nothing. Otherwise, just, just trust it as it was. So what we're basically doing here is sticking a massive negative uh, delta function at the just significant values. Uh, and it turns out, uh, and it, become, it comes from this uh, the formula here where you basically got a, a derivative on top of a thing that you might want to uh, use as an integral, uh, then that it turns out uh, makes uh, this uh, ridiculous uh, estimate uh, almost, com well, completely unbiased in the limit uh, as you make that, uh, um, statistical no man's land between 0.04 and 0.05 uh, as you make that narrower and narrower uh, and you make the delta function more and more and more negative uh, if you put those things together in just the right way then you get an exactly unbiased estimate of course it's it's a completely silly thing uh, but it's also pointing out that just removing the bias on its own is a silly criteria uh, that uh, i think ross and judy's uh, method is, is is you know really nice and and, and works well uh, and corresponds to a, a loss uh, a loss function that weights particular types of trade-offs in a, a reasonably sensible way and, and stein is, is another way of doing uh, much the same sort of thing uh, but if we only cared about uh, bias reduction on its own then sure we can do that but uh, you need to or, or uh, one solution for getting rid of the bias is to have these ridiculous estimates where you multiply a uh, beta hat by minus four and a half and, and of course we don't want to do that in practice no one would uh, believe that at all Okay. So, and one more question yep. from the, the chat. Can mm -hmm. you be, be clear what you mean with negative shrinkage? Uh, I mean, multiplying by the hat by minus, uh, by, by a, a negative quantity. So in this case, by minus four and a half. Um, so if your beta hat estimate came out to be one unit, then your, in your estimate, the report uh, would be minus four and a half units. Uh, so that's a, a completely crazy thing to do in practice, uh, but it turns out it gives you an unbiased uh, estimate. Uh, it's not the first ridiculous unbiased estimates. Uh, people working in hierarchical models are probably familiar with uh, unbiased components of variance estimates that go negative uh, and they similarly don't make any sense but they, they, they happen to be unbiased. Um, so uh, that tunnel vision on, on bias is, is unhelpful uh, and it's much better to, to balance criteria uh, about what, what we care about which I think is what uh, the Ross and Judy's method is, is doing uh, and what lots of other methods is doing, but we do need to, to say that we're doing that. Otherwise we uh, go down these, these rabbit holes of uh, just uh, looking at unbiased estimates for, for their own sake. Okay, um, other things that you can do with this, uh, I will skip over this, but there's, it looks like there's a way to get uh, confidence intervals uh, fairly straightforward from using, fairly straightforwardly uh, by using 
uh, the loss and you could apply it to Stein estimates and, and with a bit more work, I think the lasso as well, uh, you can get it, intervals out uh, in, in this way. So if that's of interest, I'm happy to discuss it uh, later. Uh, benefits of this then, uh, of course, you can add prior knowledge in and sure informative priors are, are what Bayesians always say, uh, but there's also first correction for logistic regression, which is very widely used for binary outcomes uh, when we need small uh, exact p-values or pretty close to exact p-values, and that just corresponds to sticking a Jeffries prior on and, and doing a Bayesian analysis, essentially. Uh, so there's uh, motivation for prior information just to stabilize things, uh, as well as to add uh, important uh, scientific extra information there. Uh, it's not the only estimate uh, that uh, Ross and Judy came up with, uh, and it turns out the other one is essentially Bayesian as well for a slightly different weighting function. Uh, and uh, there's a multiple roots problem, so there's a, a modest restriction on, on uh, the alpha you might be using there. Okay, uh, I do want to tell you about uh, another thing this afternoon, and uh, it's very much the same sort of machinery, but we're going to use it to motivate uh, quasi-likelihood. Quasi-likelihood uh, is a, well, uh, the, the quasi-prefix uh, means uh, things are, are like uh, other things, so quasi-modo is like a newborn baby, uh, it's where the name comes from, uh, a quasi-stellar quasi object, uh, uh, is a, qua a quasar, a quasi-stellar object, sorry, which is like a star, um, and uh, quasi-likelihood developed by Robert uh, Wedderman and John Nelder, pictured here, uh, and they developed a thing that was like a thing that already had like in the name, so that's just confusing everybody. Anyway, quasi-likelihood, what does it do? Uh, it's uh, one popular way to think about it is as a patch uh, for parametric models, where you've got some specified mean and variance, classical sort of GLM set up here as, as uh, Nelder developed, obviously, uh, and you get an estimate out, uh, and then you use some uh, matrix construction where D is a derivative and there's a diagonal uh, matrix of uh, individual observation variances, uh, and that's where your confidence intervals come from. What is quasi likely to do? Well, it relaxes that assumption about the variance uh, and, and allows you to put a, if you like, a fudge factor in there uh, to, to allow it to scale in some way uh, that's not just the, the specified function of V, but it's now got a, an extra parameter floating around. And it turns out that this means that we scale uh, the corresponding um, covariance matrix, covariance estimate, uh, by uh, an, an estimate of, of the same alpha uh, extra parameter there. So um, this isn't perfectly robust, but it turns out it, it works well and uh, it addresses a common weak spot in model-based analysis. Uh, and it's a, a good thing to do, at least in um, samples of uh, moderate size. It's a fairly uh, popular approach. How can we do it uh, using balanced loss functions? Well, uh, very much the same sort of way uh, with a, a different trade-off now. So we've seen uh, the, most of this, uh, the ingredients here before. We've got uh, decision V about precision, uh, decision D about accuracy. Uh, but now I'm going to trade off uh, this inaccuracy against some measure of badness of fit. So if the model is as a bad fit uh, to the data, uh, I'll have a high uh, score here. If it's a, a good fit, I'll have a, a low score here. Uh, then uh, I say I'm adaptively trading off uh, this uh, uh, quantity uh, for, for inaccuracy here. Uh, and so uh, R is a decision as well. So just like V was a decision uh, making a particular trade-off, then R is a decision is a trade-off decision here, just a slightly different one. It's saying how much uh, one unit of badness of worth, uh, badness of fit is worth. It's worth r squared units of this uh, theta squared divided by v stuff uh, about inaccuracy here. Uh, it turns out that the Bayes rule is, is again pretty straightforward. That uh, we just use the posterior mean for our estimate of location. But now uh, we've got this scale thing, which turns out is you just take the expectation of that sort of measure of badness of fit, uh, and that your v is the v decision is the original variance one, but now scaled uh, by that Bayes rule. Uh, that, that R decision, uh, that ratio, if you like, R for ratio there. So we're stretching uh, the posterior variance uh, by an amount that corresponds to how good or bad a, a fit the model is, is to the data. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, and uh, my measure of badness of fit, I'm going to show you a simple Poisson regression example, first of all. Uh, there it is. Uh, and what we do is, well, take an average over all the observations here, and it's the uh, Essentially, I call them Pearson error terms here. They're a bit like Pearson residuals, but um, in a Bayesian analysis, we don't need to put hats on anything. We can just say that, yeah, we've got some observations and how far away are they from the true uh, mean, in, in this case, for a person who's got the same covariates as person I uh, there. So um, a Pearson residual would put a hat on, on the theta in, in both of these terms. Uh, we get this discrepancy between the observed value and about as the, as the fitted value or the true uh, value in, in the Bayesian version uh, and then divide by the variance. Uh, 
Uh, so this thing is unitless. So I talked about um, dimensions being important here. This thing doesn't have units, so that's uh, going to make sense. Uh, at least uh, in in, Pierce, in in Poisson regression uh, settings, and uh, it's an analog of Pearson statistic to, to take the average of all these things. Pearson statistic used in Pearson's goodness of fit tests. Um, should be reasonably clear here that from the justification alone, we're only protecting against the, the variance being equal to the mean. The assumption that's present in, in Poisson regression, sure, we're relaxing that uh, and uh, and not being so uh, reliant on it uh, if we. Uh, make this trade-off by putting an extra term in the loss function there. Um, how does it behave? Well, uh, here's a standard quasi-likelihood from um, something that's very literally in, in the textbook. This is in John Wakefield's textbook. Uh, it's got long count counts, uh, 84 counties in, in Minnesota, regressed on their radon uh, exposure. Uh, there's an offset in there because we've got some idea about uh, how prevalent the disease is in, in each of the counties. So uh, on the x-axis here, we're looking at the log of observed to expected, the, the log uh, SMR. Uh, and so that's the, the a scale on which it's natural to show the straight line with the intercept uh, beta zero and slope uh, beta one. And here's what you get to fitting the model. Uh, if you look at the squared Pearson residuals, the sort of thing that uh, you should look at for diagnostic plots when doing GLMs, uh, then if the Poisson assumption holds, then these things should have mean value one, but the empirical mean value is the dashed line up here, uh, which is uh, 2.74 times bigger. So that's the, the standard non-Bayesian analysis. Uh, to do a Bayesian version of that with all the shrinkage stuff that I, I sorry, all the trade-off stuff that I just showed you, then uh, here's the model-based version uh, of, of the line, uncertainty around the line. Uh, so this is posterior uncertainty uh, about the, the line that the beta zero and beta one slopes that, that you'd get. So you see there's some spread there. Uh, and here's the uh, those Pearson error terms squared. Uh, for all the observations, all the 85 uh, observations that, that we've got. Uh, and we get a bit of uncertainty about their mean, but we're really not very much. Um, and so the value of that blue line, uh, the average of those blue lines, plural, uh, tells you how much to expand the posterior statement about variance. And uh, it turns out it's almost exactly the same amount as we saw for the frequentist version. So sure, it's in the third significant figure and the similarly trivial differences between uh, the estimates of slope uh, and uh, the model-based uh, variance that you get, and of course stretching them in the same way, then uh, sure, you're, you're going to get um, the same practical results out of this, e even though sure we've put priors on, uh, but we're uh, being robust to that particular aspect of the, the model specification in the same way that we were uh, using quasi-likelihood in, in a non-Bayesian setting. Uh, try quickly then to, uh, to show you that you it's not it's not restricted to quasi likelihood, and we don't have to worry about just means and variances. Uh, this is uh, some, I'll show you some simulation results from uh, the Behrens Fisher problem, which is just uh, comparing the mean in two groups, uh, usually with a normal assumption within each group. Uh, and of course, uh, anyone who's uh, taken really any, any statistics courses, I think we're all familiar with the idea that the, constant, the variance might not be constant uh, in each of the two groups, and we should worry about whether or not to do, for example, an uh, equal variance t test versus an unequal variance t test. Uh, in the approach that I'm using here, I'm using the equal variance assumption in the model, but then adjusting it uh, with that H term. Uh, and that's going to stretch uh, my posterior statement of variance by uh, the expectation of this quantity. And what is it? Well, uh, it's Pearson uh, again, but now weighted. Uh, it turns out that uh, this is just a weighted average of the Pearson error terms. So it's not just a, a straight um, arithmetic average that we saw in the, in the Poisson regression, but uh, this is a weighted average, and we're paying more attention uh, to the observations that are in the smaller group, uh, x equals zero and x equals one, whichever one is smaller gets more attention there. And uh, if the, uh, the variance, uh, the empirical variance uh, of the observations in, in that group, if it's bigger uh, than what you get from the overall estimate of sigma squared, the common sigma squared there, uh, then that will inflate uh, this quantity uh, and lead to wider uh, statements of uncertainty. So um, there's various different ways of writing it, but I find this one on the right uh, most most useful. So just to show you some simulation results from a very simple situation uh, where uh, you've got unequal uh, sample sizes, 100 in one group, uh, 50 in the other, uh, and a, a modest uh, difference in the means between those two groups using normal data and uh, having priors um, and um, assuming homoscedasticity, uh, how much do you stretch? Well, um, Here's how much you stretch. Uh, depending on whether the noise is uh, smaller or larger in the, in the two groups, then uh, you may stretch down to, it's uh, twice as small in, in the x equals one group here, and we uh, shrink uh, the, the variance estimate by 20% uh, uh, versus uh, inflating it by about 25% when it's uh, 
twice as big there. If there is uh, no difference between the groups, then we don't do very much. We don't shrink or uh, stretch things very much. Uh, it's all centered around one there. The estimate that you would get uh, about um, essentially the, the estimate of the standard error there is given by the product of the model-based uh, standard deviation. So that's what you get uh, actually assuming homoscedasticity. Uh, stretch it by an amount uh, that captures the amount of non-constant variance uh, in the way that I just described on the previous slide. And there's the, the amount of stretching or squeezing that you do uh, to give you the, the estimated standard errors here. How do those things turn into test statistics? Well, uh, it turns out they, they match up almost exactly uh, with uh, the classical analysis using a robust standard error estimate. So we didn't use a robust standard error estimate. We didn't have a flexible model. Uh, we just uh, patched things up afterwards by saying that we were we wanted the analysis to take account of the fact that those assumptions about uh, constant variance might not be right. And here's what it gives us. It gives us uh, the same, essentially the same uh, Z statistic as we get uh, using robust standard errors uh, in a standard wall test, which is essentially the same thing as, as Welch's unequal variance T test. Uh, you get out from that, and it doesn't matter if there's a small or, or large signal to noise that um, you know, any difference uh, between these methods is, is, is extremely trivial uh, and, and really, if you worry about whether they're giving you the same answer, then you, you should worry about bigger things. Okay, so um, there is, I've just shown you the Poisson regression and uh, the, the t-test, but there is a, a very much more general version of, of that uh, available, uh, which is uh, most of Kendrick Lee's uh, PhD work at the moment. Uh, as with the shrinkage example, then we can add priors to that to do regularization. Uh, I think the most exciting part is that you can penalize what's important in context. Perhaps you want to be robust with respect to heteroscolasticity with respect to some variables, but not others. Uh, and we don't really have great methods for doing that at the moment, but it would be straightforward to put them in here, just specify that H uh, balancing term to capture things that you care about and have it ignore things that you don't care about. So um, that's um, uh, something that the, you know, lots of, uh, Future, future exploration could be done of. Uh, also, it, it's, I think it's uh, this is again very recent work. Uh, Tamara Broderick's been looking at some uh, automated sensitivity detection for uh, individual data points. I think it may be possible to somewhat uh, automate to, to using those results to, to automate uh, what uh, a search for what analysis might be sensitive to, uh, and therefore to, to choose a, a weighting function like those quantities that we know the analysis is somewhat sensitive to. So uh, uh, I think it's a promise there for machine learning type uh, methods to do that uh, automated search for, for sensitivities and it would be useful uh, work to do. So uh, I'm gonna uh, summarize there and uh, stop talking, but um, I wanna stress that, yeah, I, I've showed you uh, one dimensional examples uh, today, but uh, it is possible to uh, extend uh, everything I've talked about data to vector uh, parameters, uh, vector theta, it's multiple uh, parameters getting shrunk uh, either all the same way or perhaps slightly differently uh, and to talk about robust covariance matrix uh, estimates. So uh, the, the math looks a bit scarier, but uh, essentially the same principles uh, apply. Um, in the first example, we saw that uh, Ross and Judy's method uh, can be motivated via adaptive Bayesian shrinkage. And that uh, gives us a way of saying, presenting it as solving a, a particular trade-off uh, and not just uh, searching for an unbiased estimate because uh, we know they're available, but uh, you might end up uh, having a silly decision if you only look uh, for unbiasedness. Uh, it makes the method flexible and it makes the intervals, I think, a little bit more straightforward to, to calculate and to interpret uh, as well. Um, we also looked at uh, quasi-likelihood and robust standard error estimates, uh, again, in the Bayesian way, but uh, an, adap an adaptive penalty uh, for uh, goodness of fit, essentially. And uh, I think a loss function is a good place to uh, specify a goodness of fit because a, a model is not going to do that. A model is going to specify um, what, what the model is and, and can't directly ask about um, uh, goodness of fit. Um, it's a way of developing inference using parametric scaffolding, which we then kick away uh, when we don't need it later on. So it is very much a sort of model-based approach, which is uh, easier to teach people about, uh, based on my experience. It's also easier to, to think about interpretation of parameters uh, in that parametric setting is, is way easier uh, than uh, trying to do everything with, with estimating equations, and certainly way easier than trying to fit uh, very, very flexible models where you can get to sandwich estimates as well, uh, but uh, it's, it's a lot of work uh, to get there as Adam uh, and his co-authors will, will attest. So uh, thanks to uh, you for uh, attending and, and, uh, and look forward to your questions in just a minute. I should thank Chloe and Kendrick who've done uh, lots of the heavy lifting on this and both are fairly close to uh, finishing their dissertations. So uh, Chloe's got a job lined up, but if you have one for Kendrick, then 
uh, he'd be happy to hear about it. Uh, thanks, of course, to, to the department uh, and particularly the, those who uh, decided to give me the apprentice lectureship. It's been a, a, an honour and a privilege uh, this year. Uh, it's uh, funded me to go and spend some sabbatical time in New Zealand uh, with Thomas Lumley uh, doing some other genetics related work uh, and uh, thinking a lot about interesting parts of statistics as always with with Thomas. Uh, also thanks to the people who put together today in particular Sandra, Sana, uh, ARD and Charles for all the seminar organization. So with that I will uh, stop and take your questions. Thank you Krem. Uh, I think this would be the time that I would usually uh, hand you an uh... And, uh, a little plague and Ross would come up to the front and have, have a photo taken together with you. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll think of doing that some, some other time. But maybe Ross, would you want to have the pleasure to ask the first one of the first questions? I'm happy to, Charles. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yep. Um, I'm not sure how I can get my face on the screen with the not being able to see anything else, but okay, I think I'm all set. So thank you, Ken. That was an excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Very nice connections between Bayesian and frequentist. Um, so I, I only have a couple of questions. Um, so you talk quite a lot about methods for correcting estimators mm -hmm. in the especially the GWAS context, how important is that versus with the tremendous numbers of large cohort studies available versus just oh, going um, and looking at um, replicate studies where you don't have the biases? Yeah. And oh, um, in terms of getting people to actually believe what, um, what comes out, then yeah, the replicate, doing the replicate studies and, and reporting those is essential. But for, for planning the replication studies, which is, of course is an important first step, then uh, yeah, that's uh, essential. There's yeah. also, I think increasingly with the whole genome sequencing, then um, for example, in, in the top med project that I work in, then to a large extent for some of the diseases that we're studying, we've got all the whole genomes uh, and, and there isn't anything to replicate them with. No. Uh, and so, and trying to do the best we can with reporting that information, then the bias correction is, is important. So there's probably some argument for doing analysis and subdividing the data somewhat first stage and then... Um, um, well, that, that, that costs you power, unfortunately. Um, I, I think this, I think it's a success story for the statisticians here to just get people to, to look at the test results and say, look, there's something going on but don't yeah. get carried away with it. Yeah. Um, so I had a more general question about the H balancing terms, which I think it's a yep. good mm -hmm. concept and nice to be able to look at selective elements of the model. But my question yep. is, uh, is it scientific? <laughs> um, <laughs> so especially in well, even the ordinary lasso, always struck me as uh, a bit artificial. I mean, it's, it's sensible to say, you know, maybe we don't have too many associations. Let's try to find the limited number, but it yep. isn't scientific. And so, I, and that, so I guess in relation to your collaborators, if you go in and specify an H function and go through the mechanics of the method you described, very nice methods. Is it, how difficult is it communicating to them what you're doing and whether it's something that they can weigh in on the sensibleness or value of the assumptions? Um, that's a good question. I, I think it, to, to construct the the age functions uh, like you say with um, for example for with regard to robustness to some uh, parts of some some covariates but not others um, yeah. then you basically end up looking at this isn't quite what happens but it's close enough that so you look at the correlation between that covariate and the Pearson residuals and the Pearson errors rather um, and I think at, at that level uh, then you could specify it to, to collaborators saying but you know, we're interested in how this thing varies with a covariate and, and which covariates. Um, and they'd, I think, be able to understand that precisely why it has to be a, 
the thing that I was calling a correlation, uh, I think is, yeah, that's probably statisticians only uh, for, for that part. Um, and they would probably struggle to, to specify that part them, themselves. So it's going to be somewhat determined by operating characteristics rather than um, a deep rooting in, in the relevant science. Well, my final not so serious comment is when you're, so, well, first I'll tell you, Judy Zong is now full professor and <laughs> tenured. Oh, professor. Right. Yeah. congratulations, Judy. I didn't know that bit. Yeah. Um, but when you're talking about quasi likelihood and you had the two, two likes in the same expression, like and like, <laughs> that, that reminded me of being here in Hawaii, leaky, leaky. <laughs> 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 One of the, go on the leaky leaky bus. Okay. So I'll let other people join in. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, thank you, Ken. So other people who have questions uh, should type in the in the chat box or if you have a long question, I think you can just type in there that you have a question and we can we can unmute you and, and you can uh, you, you 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 don't have to, to make your fingers too tired. Uh, I I'll, I'll have I'll, there was one question uh, typed in the chat box which is uh, just towards the end of the talk, which I asked uh, the speaker to hold up. Uh, one person asked, "Can you give can you be somewhat concrete about why you call this embarrassment? And why is it bad for D to be close to theta but far from theta zero?" Oh, um, that speak, uh, the, the term comes from um, a, a motivation of some, some similar work, uh, which was looking directly at testing uh, as Bayesian decisions. And uh, there you have the same uh, squared error quantity around the, the null. So if that is far from the, the null, then it's embarrassing uh, to, to miss that, that signal. Um, and that's basically the same idea as uh, type, uh, type two errors that um, if there's a true signal there and it's a really big one uh, and you miss it, uh, then that's, that's embarrassing. Um, and so I think I mentioned in the talk then, then it, yeah, if, if, you, if the thing you're studying is actually the new penicillin and you say it doesn't do anything, then that's really embarrassing. Um, if, um, for example, if you had a, a COVID uh, vaccine and, uh, and it was uh, really terrifically uh, effective and you, you report it as being ineffective, then that would be uh, wrong and also very embarrassing. Any any other questions for Ken? Right now, it's it's. I know it's hard. It's a little harder to uh, to to post questions right now. With uh... there are, I don't see any any other questions uh, coming up now. So. Uh, Usually we would say we would tell people now that we we would have a reception in in Ken's honor. Uh, that's a little hard uh, right now to, to do. So you'll you'll have to help yourself for your reception. Uh, well, looks delicious. Looks delicious, Charles. That's, that's delicious. This this is in Ken's house, so you can come by there right now. Uh, <laughs> As long as you social distance yourself, so yes, you can... you're all welcome to come around to mine for a socially distanced class of wine. Uh, uh, so, if there are no other questions, then I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll we should all thank uh, uh, Ken once more for this for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Yeah.